It seems an eternity since the U.S. and China signed a trade agreement in mid-January this year. The COVID-19 pandemic has spurred a war, a war of words. Now the U.S. has blocked cooperation over COVID-19 research between its allies and China. This proves that even science uh, can no longer provide common ground, it seems. Elsewhere, the national security law for Hong Kong and 5G development have also proven bones of contention. Despite all these qualms, China managed to surpass Mexico and Canada to reclaim the spot as the U.S.'s largest trading partner in April. China and the U.S. may be confronting each other in many fields, but is this relationship too big to fail? To unpack the evolving trend, I'm pleased to be joined from Beijing by Professor Liu Baocheng from the University of International Business and Economics and from Washington by James Early, CEO of Stansbury China, an investment research firm. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point and thanks for um, waiting. Now, as I said, you know, a lot of frictions heating up between the two countries. The list included many. I don't think we need to um, list that. So, uh, Professor Liu, let me go to you first. Exactly what's going on between the two sides? How would you describe the current affairs, current state of affairs between the two sides? Well, um, both countries recognize the importance of engaging each other, both for international politics, geopolitics, and economics. But in the meantime, we do see there is a, a bigger divide uh, in terms of the ideology, in terms of the way of handling stuff, and particularly the, uh, there has been quite a level of uh, disappointment and surprise uh, over each other in terms of the overreaction towards each other and towards the uh, commonalities uh, which we have really accumulated. So therefore, the trust is uh, being damaged. And uh, uh, worst of all, is we're going to see uh, a further decline. And I do not see much of the prospect that we're going to repair this and move forward. So therefore, the containment is really leading, uh, if not there, to a sort of a new Cold War between these two countries, which is really a quite uh, much of this appointment, which can really bring further damage mm. to both of the countries and also the global community. Yeah. Well, James, how do you describe the state of affairs at this moment? For instance, where are we compared to a year ago? How much worse is the situation and uh, some of the factors that could have contributed to the current impasse? Well, sadly, I, I'm, an op I'm an optimist, but I, I have to say it's, it's bad, but getting worse, and I, I hate to say that because you know, I like China very much and I want good relations very much, but a lot of this is potential energy, meaning in physics there's this concept where if you have a can of soda on a refrigerator, it could fall, right? Uh, a lot of these things were embedded for a long time and now they're just coming out. The, the virus has a way of accelerating, uh, crises have a way of accelerating human progress or certain developments, and while I hesitate to call this progress, a lot of these tensions were already building before the coronavirus, and mm -hmm. now they're just coming out into the fore now that there's more interaction, more media, more dialogue. Right. Um, Professor Liu, how do you describe the role the pandemic has played? I mean, since the beginning of this year, we had a, a kind of a reprieve, right, when the, the agreement was signed. But shortly afterwards, we had this very dramatic episode where things heated up very dramatically. Uh, what kind of role has the pandemic played in terms of the, its impact on the relations between the two sides? Yeah, we actually normally say that a common enemy really unites uh, because the uh, COVID-19 is a common enemy for the mankind species. So therefore, it is really a uniting power for the mankind, uh, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their political institution, uh, that we should work together to find the true cause and to find the solution as quickly as possible. But unfortunately, we see a further uh, differences in uh, this because the uh, countries begin to blame each other without scientific evidence and uh, uh, they are trying to save their own political face for the failure of managing this situation uh, in a uh, proper way and so that's really a uh, rather sad situation yeah. and also uh, right now the whole world are really uh, eagerly waiting that we are able to have a scientific breakthrough and share uh, the, the, the result of the uh, scientific research, but now uh, the U.S. declares that they're going to block this one uh, from sharing, uh, particularly with China, and that's really something very unreasonable 
and cannot be accepted by even the basic sense of humanity. Okay. Well, in, in line of the spirit of my conversation with, Ms., with Mr. Lawrence Summers, I'm going to challenge Ms., uh, Professor Liu here. Uh, in what way has China possibly contributed to the tit-for-tat, to the escalation of tensions during the pandemic? Well, uh, I think, uh, of course, you know, uh, China has the massive breakout in the first place, and China is victimized by uh, this unfortunate attack. And China is there to uh, share experiences and data with the rest of the world, and, uh, uh, and also the way how China handles this, both institutionally and culturally, uh, really command respect. And also the fact that uh, uh, as soon as the situation is reasonably stabilized, and China uh, sent the medical teams and sent the medical staff uh, the, uh, and also equipment uh, to most part of the world. And uh, so that also shows the uh, Chinese uh, cultural value uh, that is so really we are playing in a, in a shared world and sh with shared fate. And uh, the uh, certain uh, misunderstanding over there, it doesn't mean that China is completely innocent. Uh, in handling many of those fears, but in, uh, intentionally, China does mean good and does really want to share, uh, you know, both experiences and also lessons. Yeah. Well, could it have been that the fact that China handled the virus so promptly, so effectively, and so aggressively, and the fact that China uh, was uh, also generous in extending support, assistance, and also, you know, organizing trade with other countries, that all of these factors kind of annoyed the United States, Mr. James, Mr. Early? Uh, well, as Professor Lewis said earlier, a common enemy unites, and unfortunately, the, the virus is not so much the enemy. Uh, we've got two, pop it is the real enemy, but you know, we've got two fairly populist leaders, and, and, and there's been a lot of propaganda on both sides within each country uh, making the other the enemy, and I think that's really, uh, you know, really what's going on here. Uh, but I'm sorry, Sin, can you repeat your second question? I, I'm still stuck in that first thought. Yeah, well, the second question is, uh, could it have been the fact that China did um, bring the situation down very, very fast. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That the Look, United States simply find it unbelievable, you know, so that they started to question, 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 and uh, accuse, accuse, accuse. Could it have been a case? Yeah, the tide is, I understand your question. The tide has turned quickly on this. Uh, you know, China took a lot of heat globally, not just from the United States. I think everywhere for basically being too secretive for potentially covering things up for, you know, at attacking the initial whistleblowers, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, this is probably not the forum to go deep into that, but essentially people see China as culpable in an initial sense. But then after that, yeah, there's no question that the U.S. had a very, very botched response, whereas China was so effective in, in tamping down the outbreak that they're now having trouble getting patients for vaccine trials. And they're trying to look outside of China for collaboration. So and that's a good problem to have. Um, I, I wouldn't put it all as simple jealousy, but, but I think there, there, is, there is a dynamic of both sides. So if you're looking to make propaganda on either side here, you can certainly find something to dig, and, and that's what we Well, see. I'm not trying to, I'm not looking for propaganda for, for either side. Not, Again, not you, I'm along, saying just somebody yeah. generally. Not yeah. Somebody generally. Okay, yeah. um, along the same spirit of reciprocity, mutuality that uh, Professor, that Mr. Summers mentioned, what kind of responsibility has uh, the United States <coughs> have to shoulder in terms of um, um, exacerbating the tension between the two sides uh, because of the pandemic, Mr. James, Mr. Early. Sure. I mean, I mean, look, the, the U.S. has has obviously not handled the virus very well. I mean, that, that's just a plain fact that anybody could see, uh, and, and so it has taken a lot of heat from but China in terms on of that. And some of that is appropriate. I mean, oh well. I mean, look, you know, there are now saying. I mean, the, the U.S. and in many other countries. I, I think. I think it's might not be totally fair to isolate the U.S., but the U.S. is seeing China arguably take advantage of the fact that the rest of the world is, is flat on its back from this pandemic and, and use that as a chance to be a little bit more belligerent with these wolf warriors and, and foreign policy to make certain actions that maybe in a, a smooth sailing world might be more noticed. And regardless of whether that's real or a perception, that's certainly a perception that's creating reality among much of the world. So you're seeing the U.S. respond to that. The U.S. is going to say, hey, you know, we're, we're, 
We're just responding appropriately. In fact, we arguably should have done this a long time ago. For 30 years, the U.S. foreign policy towards China was guided by the idea of let's just kind of kind of be a little bit loose, and as China opens up, it will gradually embrace these world economic norms, as Professor Summer might say. But uh, we're seeing that not happen. It was already not happening before the virus, and now China seems to be kind of pulling back hard from the perspective of the rest of the world. So I think you're seeing a reaction to that. Um, so the big question really is where are we heading and what must be done, what can be done to prevent things really getting out of control? Professor Liu, uh, looking ahead over the next half year, for instance, uh, what is your prediction and what, what really concerns you? Well, uh, we have the foundation and we have the realistic solid ground to work together to gain a win-win situation. And right now, it is really a critical test for the politicians and also big business leaders on both sides of the Pacific, uh, you know, in which road are they going to take? Uh, is it really containment and adversary, or is it really uh, cooperation and uh, uh, looking for a shared prospect? So, uh, but right now, we do see that uh, they, uh, on one hand, the uh, economic in engagement there, uh, first phase trade agreement uh, uh, remains uh, to be implemented without interruption. And uh, the, the fact that uh, you know, uh, these, uh, uh, many of those arguments are really flaming uh, you know, uh, in terms of the responsibility over the pandemic, over uh, the Hong Kong issue, and uh, uh, also okay. over the South China Sea, uh, yeah. human rights, and all of this. You know, if managed well, we still can really work together constructively, but otherwise that's it's going to be destructive. Yeah, okay, that's a big if. I have to leave it there, unfortunately. 30 seconds to go. Many thanks to James Early. I'll hear your response next time, maybe. And many thanks to Professor Liu Baocheng joining us from Beijing. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LX. Thanks for watching. You've got The Point.